I am Greg Voigt, Senior Pastor of Woodland Hills Church, and I'm delighted to be here for the Happy Hippie Jesus Show, whatever it's called, something like that. The Happy Jesus Hippie Show. Yeah, it's just a show that Bill thinks Jesus is a hippie, and no one agrees with him. So that's all that is. That has oh, not we, been the case with our polling. Well, you're running the polling, so. Fake news. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, I've learned in my life that any news I don't agree with, I can just call fake and move on. So yes. your polling's all fake. We are in a post-truth society, it seems. Ah, uh, yes, there is that. I have much of your truth. Yeah, but Bill does have a question he likes to ask all of our guests to kind of start. All right. So well, I'm just going to let him ask it. Well, Go ahead. Jeremy's already tainted the question, but, you know, Jeremy feels like Jesus is uh, just this really boring dude who happens to be the Messiah and the Son of God. But I think Jesus is so much more and is actually could be called a hippie. Do you believe that Jesus could be a hippie? <laughs> a 60s hippie? When I think of 60s hippie, I think of a lot of reefer, and I don't think Jesus would be too into reefer. But you know, he looks like a hippie, and in some ways he's countercultural like a hippie. And yeah, so I say qualified, yes, depending on what all you associate with being a hippie. I keep telling people this t question tells me a lot more about what people think of hippies than what they think of Jesus. <laughs> you're, you're probably right about that. I just go back to Woodstock. I, to me, hippie was Woodstock. And there's some things about the Woodstock culture that I'm sure Jesus would, would be congruent with Jesus. But there's a lot of parts of it that I think would be not so congruent. Make love. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that seemed to be pretty true of Jesus' life, too. There was some parts of the culture that worked with him, and then he seemed to get himself into trouble a lot as well. He was countercultural to the core, yeah. So tell me a story, Greg. It can be from your own life. It can be from the Bible. You can just make one up right now about a hippie named Bill. Just any story that helps us understand how you think about Jesus. Hmm. How I think about Jesus? One story? Well, you know, here, here's one, an event that was really a turning point for me. It uh, happened about uh, 30 years ago, I guess it is. I, I, I bring it up only because it had such an impact in my life. Where um, I... But, uh, I'll try to keep this succinct, but I had a uh, babysitter come over who was a student of mine. Uh, my wife and I had three young kids, and, and she was going to babysit while we go out. And it was around Christmas time, and the babysitter brought presents for my two daughters, but forgot that I had a son. And when she realized that I had a son and she had no gift for the son, I had this strong emotional reaction to me that was way out of proportion. And I ended up you know, bring, bringing her, uh, sneaking her a present that we had gotten him for Christmas, and then she gave it to him as though it was from her. I wonder, like, well, why did I have such a reaction to that? Well, the next day, I was in prayer, and all of a sudden, I got a picture. I, I, like a, it, was, it was like a memory came to me where I, my grandmother came into the house, and she said she had, because my mom had died. Uh, I was like two years old at this point, and, and my grandmother was raising us. And she came home, and she had Christmas presents for everybody. She announced it. And she gave a present to my older sister and a present to my older brother and a present to my younger sister. But when it was my turn, there was no present. And, and my older sister said, Grandma, doesn't Greggy get a present? And, and she looked at me with a scowly face and she said, no, Greggy's a bad boy and bad boys don't get Christmas presents. I had never remembered that event up until that time. In fact, I had to call my older sister to verify it. And it didn't go down exactly like I remembered it, but, but the gist of it was there. I, I looked out in this bag and, 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 and that she had, there's no present there. And that was devastating for me. And I think that that was, among a lot of other things, a kind of a message there that I, the first part, first part of my life, I tried to live, it was like a prophecy that I tried to live out. You're a bad kid. It's translated in my head as I'm a bad kid. And so, and it wasn't just that one event. It was reinforced, you know, by a lot of things. But, but uh, I went down a, a trajectory where I was living out that narrative. I inherited that narrative. After that, I came a point where the next time I was praying, I saw that that event came up, came to me again. But this time, grandmother comes in and says, I got presents for everybody. And, and she gives this uh, nice doll to my older sister and this cool bow to my brother and this the toy horse to my sister. And then when it's my turn, I, I, you know, there, there's no present. And so my sister said, Grandma, doesn't Greg get a present? And this time I look up, but instead of seeing my grandmother, I see the face of Jesus. And he's got this tender smile. <laughs> he's got this tender smile, and he rubs my head. And he says, yeah, I, I, I saved him for last. I got a special present for him because he's a special kid. And I look in the, down in his back, and there's this big red airplane. 
uh, one of those old World War I airplanes game where they have two wings on, two, two, tier, two tiered wings. And, and I remember as a kid, I always wanted this one particular red airplane. And for some reason, I never got it. And here I, I got it. And, and it was just Jesus. It's how Jesus heals us with his love. And when we invite Jesus into our memories, into the wounding messages that we've had and whatever, he's a genius at, 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 at bringing about a healing there. And I don't know, that love, just loving me as a little kid, did a whole lot. And, and that, 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 that set in motion, you know, I, I, over a couple of weeks of where Jesus was just coming in into the, my mind all the time and during prayer and, and, and augmenting the healing. But it really was a turning point for me uh, in, in my own healing process. And I think that just reflects the tenderness. And, and, and the, you know, G- Jesus is God incarnate. That, that, it's because God's character is incarnational. God wants to be intimate. He wants to be on the inside of us. You know, he wants to get as close to us. And, and, and not just close to our good stuff, but close to our bad stuff, the sinful stuff, the wounding stuff, the terrible stuff, the shameful stuff. And shed is the light of his love on it. And that, that just transforms everything. Wow. Thank you for sharing that story. That that might be my new favorite story that I've heard on this podcast. I still get choked up and I'm going to talk about it. Yeah, we yeah. Hear it. yeah, we could hear you you getting choked up. And it's amazing how Jesus can take those painful memories or even anger and turn them inside out and, yes. and empty them out. And it's only when we confront them and face them that Jesus begins to do that quite often. Yeah. And, and all of that, Bill, is really a reflection of, of what Paul says in Second Corinthians 3, where he says that you know, for unbelievers, they have a veil over their mind that keeps them from seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But when a believer turns to the Lord, that veil is removed, Paul says. It's a veil over our mind. And now we're able to see something we couldn't see before. And then Paul says, as we with unveiled faces, and now that we can see something in our mind that we couldn't see before, as we gaze upon uh, the, the, the face of Jesus Christ— we're transformed from one degree of glory to another. So it's the beauty that we behold in our imagination that transforms us into that beauty. And so I always encourage people to ask the Spirit to activate their imaginations and to open up their minds and their memories and to invite Jesus to come into those memories and, and, and just do his healing work. And it can be so beautiful. He's a great therapist and he's free. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I know one oh, thing you really do wonderful. for therapy, reading and kind of connected to me to you in that is apparently you're a metalhead like me. Hey, oh, oh, you're a metalhead. Great. Oh yeah. I'm I know a metalhead. Special author. I know it. <laughs> you don't find too many pastors that are metalheads. Now I'm a little more towards the punk and alt rock or alt metal end, but yeah, metalhead. Like uh, Nirvana. Nirvana tool of, uh, you know, Oh, tools. Great. I like oh, yeah. it. Have you heard the new album? No, I, I haven't. As a drummer, you'll love it, man. It's, well, it's, it's a Danny it's album. What, the drumming is what got me into this stuff. I, I, I first started you know, like just being amazed by speed metal drumming, and, and then I tried to learn it. I'm still trying to learn it. But uh, then I started actually liking the music for the first own sake. It's, uh, it, it's cool. Sometimes the lyrics, you got to just wave aside. But I don't listen to lyrics much anyways. I like just the power of it. It just grabs me. It, there's something cathartic about it, too, that just you let it lets it things out. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I believe Jesus can show up anywhere. I mean, especially in the places we Amen. don't expect Jesus, because if Jesus didn't show up in the places that we don't expect, then how is anybody who is not in the church ever going to find Jesus? There you go. No, no, you have to expect the unexpected. Yeah. If there's anything we learn about God in, in the person of Jesus Christ, it's that he doesn't conform to our rules, doesn't go by our categories, doesn't meet our expectations, turns everything upside down. He's, a, he's an uncommon sensical of, I mean, what kind of God becomes a human being and then you're omnipotent and you get yourself crucified. You, you got all the power in the world. You can do anything you want. So what do you choose to do? Get crucified. Uh, that doesn't, uh, and, and Paul says that that's the power of God. First Corinthians 1 18, uh, the cross, it's foolishness to the world, but to us it is the power and the wisdom of God. But when God shows off his power, it looks like him getting crucified. Uh, that is so radical and so beautiful that the majority of Christians throughout history haven't believed it. We still keep on looking for this Zeus kind of power when Jesus shows us a, a cross kind of power. Yeah. yeah. So you have this new book, or I guess it's a couple of years old now, where you talk a lot about uh, the cross. And you talk about it a little bit, maybe a little differently than some of us were taught about it growing up. So 
Why don't you tell us a little bit about your work around the cross and how you view it a little bit differently? I've just become convinced that that the, the cross is the center of the biblical revelation. And and I, I spend you know quite a bit of time in, in my book, uh, Crucifixion of the Warrior God, and then Cross Vision, which is the popular version of that. And in both works, I spend a lot of time establishing that the New Testament itself teaches us that we're not to read the Bible as a flat book, as though every depiction of God had equal authority and every instruction of God had equal authority, but rather it, it all points to the cross. Jesus says, all scripture is about me. And in Luke 24, he, he, he says that he, uh, he opened the eyes of his disciples so they could see how all scripture, uh, the law and the prophets, how it points to Jesus and in particular to his sacrificial death. So I think we should read the whole Bible through the lens of the cross. In other words, knowing exactly what God is like as he's revealed on the cross, we can now look at the whole biblical revelation and see things that sometimes the original audience couldn't see. And, and the, the most important thing in, in, in our exegesis or our hermeneutics is to discern how every aspect of Scripture bears witness to the revelation of God's perfect love that's uh, revealed on the cross. Yeah, and I think you call that the uh, looking glass, cruciform yeah, yeah, looking yeah. glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I use the uh, metaphor from, uh, you know, the looking glass metaphor in Alice in Wonderland. And it's you know, when she steps through that looking glass, that mirror, uh, everything's upside down, everything's topsy-turvy. It's just a, a completely different reality there. And, uh, and that, that's how the cross functions for us. It's, it's a mirror we can look through to see you know, the, a lot of other things going on in, in the biblical revelation that we maybe couldn't see before. If you could, tell us a little bit about your journey and how your understanding of Scripture has evolved over, the, I don't know, the last 10 or 20 years. Because I think you set out to write a very different book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, 14 years ago, 13 years ago, I guess it was, I started to write this book where I was going to see uh, the clear I got about the centrality of Jesus and the centrality of, of the, the, the revelation of the cross. The clear I got about who God is revealed in Jesus. The foggier I got about this, some of the portraits of God in the Old Testament, where God acts in ways that are not at, don't seem at all Christ-like. And, and so I, I, about 14 years ago, thought, okay, I got to reconcile this. People were asking me questions. Well, what about God when he commands, show no mercy, slaughter them all, to kill everything that breathes, men, women, child, babies, even the animals, don't let them live. And, and they're asking me, so I thought I'd write a book in which I try to justify God engaging in the violence that's attributed to him in the Old Testament. And so I had all, you know, the, the, the uh, difficult portraits of God on, on one column. And then I had collected over the years all these sort of explanations why did God have to say slaughter all the genocide or slaughter all the, the, the Canaanites? And why did God have to devour uh, the Pharaoh's army in the sea and things like that? And so I got about 40 pages into this book and I thought to myself, uh, sorry, this just sucks. <laughs> My explanations were, I, I just thought, totally inadequate. And, and what made them more particularly inadequate, was that I came to see that the task that I, that I have to wrestle with, the task isn't just to try to make God look less mean, less monstrous, as Paul Copens would put it. It's not even to make God look a little more Christ-like in those you know, depictions of him engaging in this violence. The challenge is I have to interpret the, I have to show how those depictions of God being so violent how they actually bear witness to the cross. How does the genocidal portrait of God saying slaughter them all, how does that bear witness to the self-sacrificial, nonviolent, enemy-embracing love of God that's revealed on Calvary? That's the, the, the exegetical challenge. And my explanations did nothing to, to help out with that. And so I, I had to just, I, I abandoned the project and I had to go back to the drawing board. I learned from Origen. Uh, he's a second century, second, third century theologian, one of my favorites. And, and he said, he was very honest with the, the, the difficulties in the Bible, the, the, the portraits of God that he says are unworthy of God and, and other problems. And he says, when, when, when you come upon stuff in the Bible that, you, that uh, is clearly unworthy of God, and it's unworthy of God if it doesn't conform to the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Um, he says, don't dismiss it because all scripture is inspired. Don't get mad, but rather submit yourself to the text and humbly uh, seek the Holy Spirit and keep on digging. And he uses this metaphor all the time of a treasure buried beneath the ground. And he says the most precious revelations of scripture are not on the surface, they're beneath the surface, and you got to dig for them. Um, and God intentionally makes it that way, so you have to dig for them. And he says, eventually, Spirit will reveal to you a deeper truth that shows you how these apparent problems, these, these apparently unworthy pictures of God, how in fact they are worthy of God. 
it'll be a deeper truth. And so I, for several months, just sat in this extreme cognitive dissonance of, of, on the one hand, believing I need to embrace the entire Old Testament as divinely inspired because Jesus did, and I call him Lord, so I can't correct his theology. So I have to accept the Old Testament, and yet, precisely because Jesus is my authority and his revelation of God has preeminence in everything, I can't accept some of those depictions of God. <laughs> so on uh, Jesus' authority, I both must and cannot accept these violent portraits of God. And I just sat in this conundrum for the longest time. But then there came a point where I, and, and I don't claim this is divine revelation. This could be Greg finding the face in the clouds that he's looking for. But I began to uh, experience or see how these violent portraits of God actually do point to the cross. I began to see the cross in the midst of the most ghoulish pictures of God that we have in Scripture, like the genocidal portrait of God. And it, it was something like a, like a, if you've ever read one of these or ever looked at one of these magic eye books where it, on the page it looks like just random wallpaper designs. But if you look at it the right way, if you look at it, look through it, not at it, or, you know, relax your eye, they have all these techniques, a, a three-dimensional object will arise out of it. And that's kind of what happened is I just, in prayer, was meditating on this and, and it sat in this conundrum. I began to see kind of like a three-dimensional portrait rising out of a page. I began to see how, how, the, how the cross is at the base of all these uh, depictions of God. Yeah, I think one of the things you said about that was that in those moments that we find, like in the genocidal or the conquest narrative, that it's God stooping down to bear the sin of God's people. Right, right. I make the case for this in the book. I can't make it here. It would take too much. But that you know, Paul says that the cross, that the crucified Christ, uh, all the treasure of God's wisdom is found in the crucified Christ. And if all the wisdom of God is found in the crucified Christ, in fact, Paul says he is the wisdom of God, then it seems to me that whenever we're thinking about anything pertaining to God, we ought to be looking to the cross. And so rather than uh, assuming that we know what it means for God to breathe scripture, let's look at the cross and ask, how did God breathe that revelation? Because the whole Bible is there to point to this. And what I found on, on, on the, when, when, you, when you look at the cross is that God, he breathed that, that revelation, that perfect revelation himself. He breathed that by not just acting toward human beings, by becoming a human and so on, but also by allowing human beings to act toward him and even fallen principalities and powers to act towards him as they manipulated the masses to orchestrate the crucifixion. So God's breathing isn't a one-way unilateral thing. God's breathing both involves God moving toward us, but also God allowing us to act toward him and condition what is produced as a result of uh, his, his breathing. And so on the cross, here we see a perfect revelation of God, but it involves God reading this revelation by allowing people to abuse him, crucify him, mock him, and all that. And, and, and the cross is beautiful insofar as we can, by faith, see that God is the one who, who was acting toward us, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But it's gross. It's ugly insofar as God allows us to act toward him. So the cross is revoltingly ugly on the surface, but beautiful in its depth. And when we look to the cross, it's not what we see on the surface that reveals God. The surface reveals our sin. It's what we by faith see going on behind the scenes, that God is stooping to bear our sin and therefore take on an appearance that reflects the guilt of that sin and the ugliness of that sin. Now, if that's how God breathed the revelation on the cross, I think we should look at the whole Bible as breathed in that way. And so, like, for example, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 at one point, he says, uh, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you, Corinthians, because you're all dividing on the basis who baptized you. I thank God I didn't baptize any of you except for the household of Stephanus. Oh, yes, I also did baptize the household of Chloe. You know, actually, I don't remember who I baptized, but and then, then he goes on. Well, I'm sure God has a perfect memory. God knows exactly who Paul baptized and who he didn't baptize, but Paul doesn't. And God doesn't perfect, doesn't coercively come down and, 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 and force us to think in a certain way or to have a better memory than we have. God uses people as they are. And so he reads the revelation through Paul. And guess what? It includes Paul's faulty memory. So when we read the Bible, I, insofar as anything conforms to the character of God as revealed in Christ, that I take as being the spirit of God breaking through. But insofar as I find things in the Bible that depictions of God that fall beneath uh, the character of God as revealed in Christ, that I think reflects not to the degree that that's true. It reflects God allowing the place where his people are at and the way that they view him 
allowing his people to condition what gets result from his breathing. And so we, it's not surprising that we find uh, in, in the Old Testament a number of depictions of God that look almost identical to the ancient Near Eastern gods of uh, the, the Jews' neighbor, uh, their, their, their ancient Eastern neighbor. They use some of the same phrases. In fact, they, they, they borrow some of the same songs. Because this, this is how people view God. They view God as he lived up on a mountain, he rides on the clouds, he throws thunderbolts, he blows smoke out of his nostrils. Those are all standard ancient Near Eastern themes. If, if God's not going to coercively correct people's thinking, and I, if the cross is the power of God, cross is anything but a coercive kind of power. It's an influential kind of power. And so based on the cross, I see God influencing people as far as he can towards the truth. But since he won't coerce them, there comes a point where God must humbly accept them, love them as they are. And that means their fallen and culturally conditioned portrait of God is, is, is what's going to be a uh, result from God's breathing. It reflects both God acting toward them, but also God accepting them where they are, accommodating their sin, bearing their sin, and thereby taking on a, a semblance, an appearance that reflects the ugliness of that sin, just like he does on the cross. There's a lot of seductiveness to violence, and the seductiveness yeah. to it is that violence is an illusion of power. I mean, it's a, it's a real easy illusion to create, too, because violence has these pictures that show power, like even in a fight, I've knocked you down. But yeah, the yeah. cross and resurrection expose it for what it, what, what it really is, that it is yes, truly yes. Power, powerless. Yeah, yep, yep. The cross is the, if, the, if you see the cross as the full revelation of God, then the cross is at the same time the full exposing of all that's not God, of all the lies, and, and, and the, the truth of what's going on. That's why on, on the cross, God bears the sin of his people and shows the ugliness of the sin that he's, that he's bearing, but he does it now as a victim. Whereas in the portraits of God, he's portrayed as the, the perpetrator of violence. Now he's the victim of violence. I, I agree with Gerard, Rene Gerard, uh, to, to this extent, that he, in, in doing that, Jesus exposes what he calls the scapegoat mechanism. And, and I don't want to get into all of that, but it just shows that he, he's showing that all the while, God has been a victim of human violence. You, we project our violence onto God, and we have God engage in violence in our name, just like all um, throughout history, people have done this. And the, but the cross is, is the exposing of all that. Here's what I'm truly like. I'm not the, a God who destroys my enemies. I'm a God who dies for my enemies and does that to redeem his enemies and turn them into friends. Now, that's a really powerful book. And your book unpacks it really well, especially if you're brave enough to dive into the two volume set. You've mentioned a couple of times in this interview about prayer and how it was important to you and how through prayer, you've kind of received some healing for memories and through prayer, you've kind of received inspiration. Yeah, so why don't you just take a few minutes and just unpack for us what prayer looks like for you and what you mean by when you say that? There's different kinds of prayer. You know, there's uh, there's intercessory prayer and there's warfare prayer. I totally believe in the power of prayer. I, I, I think that... Uh, God's wired it into creation since he wants a relationship with us, and a relationship is all about communication. Uh, God hardwired it into creation that when his people communicate with God, things get done that otherwise won't get done. A whole lot hangs on whether or not the people of God are, are, are willing to pray. So I believe in intercessory prayer and spiritual warfare prayer, but there's another kind of prayer that, that I, has meant so much to me, and that's, that, that's a sort of contemplative prayer or resting prayer. And the goal of resting prayer is simply to you be you and let God be God and enjoy being together. Enjoy God enjoying you. And I think this is the center of the, 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 the gospel. We have a marriage-like relationship to, to, to God, and he wants an intimacy with us. And so uh, going back to 2 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 3 again, I encourage folks to have a, a set-apart time where they have a date with Jesus. A, a time, it's just like when you get married, you know, you get married because you want to be, be together, right? You enjoy each other's company. But if you're not careful, that marriage can degenerate into just being sort of co-partners where you raise kids and pay bills together. Uh, you, every marriage needs to have time where you take a break from your busy life and just be together. That's why you got married. And just enjoy one another. Keep that, And that keeps the flame of fire going. So also, uh, God didn't save us because we're going to be such good evangelists or good preachers or good exegetes or good anything. Uh, he, he saved us because he, he loves us and wants to, he doesn't want to go on into eternity without us. And so being with God, just hanging with Jesus is, is so important. And here, 
I ask the Spirit to help me see Jesus say to me and act toward me all the things he says about me in Scripture. I know God so loves the world, and that's a beautiful truth. But what will really hit me is when I can see and hear and sense Jesus himself saying, Greg Boyd, I love you. It, it, that's where it gets personalized. That, that, that's where the transformation occurs. I like to have a time where I, 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 I do this a couple times a week. I encourage people to at least do this once a week. We set aside a half hour or so, turn off the lights, maybe turn on your favorite background music, but without lyrics, because that will get in the way. But just whatever, music is a gift from God that can open us up if we allow it. And then ask the Spirit to bring you to Jesus. In, in a church tradition, they refer to the imagination as the inner sanctum, the inner sanctuary, where the truths of God become concrete, incarnational, experiential, and transformative. Uh, and I think it's absolutely vital. Knowing information will never transform you. It's what you experience as true that, uh, that, that, that that changes you from the inside out. How did you get started doing this practice? And was it difficult at first? Or do you find yourself wandering off, chasing butterflies and thinking about other things? Or have you been able to? <laughs> I automatically, it, from the moment I became a Christian, I always imagine Jesus when I'm talking to him. I, I am very visual. And so and when I pray, I imagine, you know, the, the, the power of God coming down on somebody. And I can, in my mind's eye, I see it. And I've learned that some people just naturally do that. And those are the people who tend to get more into worship, for example, because when, they, when they're singing, they enter a different reality. They're in the heavenlies. They're, they're imagining the Lord and whatever they're singing about. So they're in that. And because they're, what, they're seeing something concrete and they're experiencing something concrete, it gets registered as real and important to them. Whereas another person who could be just as sincere in their faith, maybe even more godly, but they just never, for whatever reasons, have visualized things in their mind or, or imagined things. When they're worshiping, they're just singing, and nothing else is going on in their mind. And so it, it can become boring, it becomes lifeless. You certainly don't want to do it very much. It, it's like some people, when they pray, they find that their mind wanders. And the reason your mind wanders is because you're not, you don't have something concrete to pay attention to. Uh, there's a, a monk in, in the 15th, 16th century named St. Francis de Sales, and he said that the mind is like a, a wild bird that will fly around the room all you know, to the end of the day unless you put it in the cage of the imagination. Our mind always gravitates toward, towards what's real. And the more concrete and more vivid, the more experiential something is, the more real it feels to us. And to the degree it feels unreal, our mind's going to gravitate towards something else that, that is real. So if you're not focusing concretely on Jesus while you're praying, you're not, nothing go, nothing's going on in your imagination. Well, then what is real is that uh, you've got a, a groceries to pick up and you've got that car you got to get repaired and the lawn needs mowing. And so your mind is going to gravitate towards what those things. Those things are important because they're real. If, if you're not envisioning and getting concrete with Jesus and stuff, it just won't feel real. And so I first became aware that I was doing this when I encountered people who were doing it. And in fact, I, I, I first encountered this when I was teaching a class and I just started talking about something that I had experienced in prayer. And, and someone accused me of being new age. <laughs> and I said, what? And this is back in like 1989. And, and David Hunt had just come out with a book called The Seduction of Christianity, in which he, anybody who uses their imagination or encourages the imagination was whitewashed as a new age conspirator, including James Dobson on Focus on the Family. It, it, was, it was crazy. That, that developed a kind of an evangelical paranoia towards the imagination, which I think is just disastrous. Taking away Imagination and prayer is like asking me to think about my wife without picturing her. I, it's just, it's disastrous. Fortunately, that's loosened up now some. And, and so we're getting, we're now talking about imagination and those sorts of things. So that got me studying church history, uh, like, you know, what's behind this. And I've learned that there's a long tradition going back to origin and before that in the second century of people intentionally, it's called cataphatic prayer, praying with images. They intentionally focus their imagination on, uh, on, on, who they're praying to or who they're worshiping. Or when they read the Bible, they, they are imagining the Bible story. And there, there's St. Francis of Loyola they had a whole seminar on this where you, you, you walk people through the Gospels over a four-week period of time. Dude, it's so, so transformative. So there's a long tradition here. It's based in the Bible. Look at 2 Corinthians 3 and 4. And um, it's not a New Age conspiracy. But yeah, that, that's how I got into this. Funny because when you were writing about the triumphal entry in the book, and you use some really great images, especially talking about Jesus getting on the donkey's colt and his feet dragging. It was like an adult being on a tricycle. But my yeah, yeah, mind yeah. went to a different place 
And you remember those mechanical horses that used to be outside of the grocery stores? That, oh, yeah, 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 and yeah. I imagined an adult on that. And, so, <laughs> and it's amazing how real it becomes when you can add in images that relate to your world. And yep, yep, yep. We all know this. Like A preacher can give all the great teaching in the world, but if you don't <laughs> illustrate it with a story uh, or something memorable, it's not going to stick. Because it's what's concrete, what's narrative, what's imaginable that 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 uh, our mind gravitates to. Information, not so much. This is Bishop Gary Muller, and I urge, no, I order all our pastors to go to iTunes and rate the Happy Hippie Jesus Show five stars. And if you can figure out how to make it six, you do that as well. This is the word that has come to me from the Lord. You know what new narrative jumped in my head, though, was as I was reading it was, wouldn't it be awesome if Christians next Fourth of July, if there's another military parade in Washington, did a tricycle parade on the other end of, uh, of Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. Yeah, you know what? That, that would be brilliant. It's, it's that kind of satire, you know, that's like, uh, yeah, you guys are powerful. Ooh, big tanks. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We can sure kill a lot of people there, can't you? Praise <laughs> God. God bless America. I love Jesus <laughs> having that sense of humor, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's more humor in the Gospels than most of us realize. Oh, I think by far. So when you were talking about your answer, you mentioned several uh, historical figures and saints in the church. And I actually had a conversation the other day. We were talking about different ways to understand scripture. And this woman looked at me. She goes, that sounds like just a bunch of new age hippie stuff where people can believe whatever they want. (laughs) Perhaps making fun of my podcast. So if you could just take a minute and talk about some different ways that people have understood scripture throughout the history of the church. And I think the way you're advocating to understand Scripture is actually a very old way to understand Scripture, and it's the literal interpretations that we grew up hearing that are a more newer age thing. Yeah, yeah. First, we'll start by looking at how the, the New Testament authors viewed Scripture. You know, they, they, they quote Scripture a lot, but they always quote it. It always has some Christ-centered meaning for it, and they go to great lengths to find Christ in the Old Testament. In fact, if you look at uh, you know, some of the ways that they use the Old Testament, uh, it wouldn't pass in a seminary class today. They weren't that concerned with the original meaning of a verse. They were concerned with its Christ meaning. So, for example, Hosea, in, in Hosea 6, verse 2, uh, Yahweh says, Out of Egypt I've called my son. And he's talking about Israel. Israel was a son. I called him out of Egypt. So then Jesus ends up having to migrate to Egypt to get away from Herod. And then when he returns, Matthew applies that 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 phrase there, this fulfills that which was written out of Egypt, I've called my son. And he's not saying that Hosea predicted that this would happen. What he's saying is, here we find a way in which Jesus parallels Israel. Jesus is the new Israel, and this is God's son. And so he applies, it, whenever there's any correspondence in the Old Testament uh, and, and something Jesus does, Matthew will bring it out in order to show that, that um, you know, this is the Messiah. But he didn't have much concern for the, the original context of it. Then when you get in the early church, they continued to have a, a Christ-centered and even cross-centered theology. They didn't read it as a flat book. It was it's all pointed to him. And uh, um, and that's why Origen could say, and Origen used allegory. Uh, I, I, that was a common exegetical technique back then. I don't think it's valid today, but, but uh, um, they would use whatever strategies were available to them to find Christ in the Old Testament, even in those violent portraits of God. And, and they struggled to, to, to do that. Now, then when the church came into power in the, in the fourth century and inherited this from Constantine and, be, and, and accepted the invitation to help run the Roman Empire, well, now things change because now you can't run an empire unless you're willing to have laws that have teeth with them, which means you're going to have to engage in violence. And you got to engage in violence to protect the borders and all that stuff. So now Christians had to get OK with violence. And though, now though, those portraits of God, those violent portraits of God in the Old Testament, which Origen and John Cassian and Gregory of Nyssa and other theologians wrestled with because they were problematic, trying to show how they point to Christ. Now those same portraits became advantageous. And now the church insisted that those things must be literal. 
It's hard to motivate people to go out and kill for your country unless you can say that God's on your side. It's hard to find that God's on your side if you're sticking with Jesus. So you jump over Jesus and grab onto these Old Testament violent portraits of God, and there you go. And the main function these violent portraits have had throughout history has been just that, uh, to justify violence. Uh, we, we can. America was founded on this. They came over here saying, we are the new Israel, and these natives here are the Canaanites. And so just as Joshua slayed the Canaanites, we are justified slaying them. It, it's been terrible. So throughout church history, there, there's been different levels of meaning they I found in Scripture. Uh, it's called the theological reading of Scripture, where you, you read it not with a historical critical lens, but you find the various layers of meaning uh, that are found in the text. Something radically different happened in the Enlightenment period, however, and that's when critical scholars began to say, we can't treat the Bible as though it was a unique book. If we're academics, we have to treat it like, like it's any other book. And, and they came up with the rule that says, therefore, the original meaning of any passage is the only legitimate meaning. Church has never held that view, but that came, that was the humanist view. The people who didn't believe the Bible was inspired, they said, let's read it like any other book. And then those are the folks who trained many of the pastors, basically, who are around today. So today, that mantra that you have to stick to the original meaning uh, is mainly championed by the evangelicals. Uh, but it's a, it, it's a new position. The church never held that position. Uh, in fact, it's a humanist position. It reflects the, the humanism of the Enlightenment period. So, yeah, the, the scriptures have undergone a lot of different uh, uh, perspectives o- over the years. Yeah, it's a good thing that nobody <laughs> told Paul that. <laughs> exactly. I'm glad he didn't stick to the original meaning. Yeah. Paul didn't seem to care about the original meaning. He just he had his own agenda to yeah, that. As you said, you said it better than me. So just was, rewind and, his tape. Yeah. And since I think Paul was divinely inspired, you know, the, his agenda was a good one. <laughs> I'm, I am for finding Christ in the Old Testament any way you can. Uh, showing how all of Scripture uh, ultimately is boils down to, funnels down to uh, the crucified Christ. Yeah, and you brought up Jericho and kind of in the Americans coming over and kind of will slay the Canaanites. How can we read that, I guess, through a Christ-centered view of the Old Testament? How can we read like a story like that in the Old Testament or understand it? Yeah, and I'll give you the very truncated version. For details, please see Cross Vision or Crucifixion of the Warrior God. But okay, so to start with, um, if Jesus is the definitive revelation of God, you see me, you see the Father, right? That's what Jesus says. Uh, if I if, if I'm locked in on that, that, that is true, and and all other revelations are, are are there to point to this one, which means that there can't be any competition here. Nothing can be, you know, it's not Jesus plus every other portrait of God in the Bible that constitutes the revelation of God. Jesus is the singular Word of God. So insofar as anyone in the Old Testament saw anything genuine about God, they were seeing the same thing we see in Jesus Christ. It's just that they couldn't see him clearly. Hebrews 1, 3 says that they, they or Hebrews 1, 2 and 3 said, that says that they, uh, in the past, God, they got glimpses of the truth. But in, the, in, in Jesus, the Son himself has come and made God known. And he is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's very essence. So if I lock that in, when I come upon a portrait of God saying, show no mercy, slaughter, everything that breathes, since that is not consistent with the God revealed in Christ, that I, I, I that, that, that reflects God bearing sin, the sin of his people. And so I, knowing what God's like, I consider the portrait of God on the surface here, this gentle style of God, to be similar to the, the, the surface of the cross. It reflects the sin that God is bearing. But I then exercise the same faith I have when I see the cross as a full revelation of God. I exercise that same faith to see that same revelation in this genocidal portrait of God. Faith looks through the external sin-mirroring surface of the cross to see God stooping this infinite distance to enter into this crucified Christ. So also, I will exercise faith to look through the surface portrait of God in these accounts to see God stooping to bear the sin of his people. Since God, so it's, it's like this. Everyone in the ancient Near East believes that their God will help them conquer a land. And if you go into a land, you want to take it, you got to kill all the people. And so God did give them this promised land. But I think it was Moses who assumed that that means you have to kill people to get into it. And if God's not going to coercively correct Moses uh, because he's not a coercive God, then there comes a point where he has to accept Moses as he is, including his view, this common ancient Near Eastern view, that that, uh, you have to slaughter people to help your God out in taking this land. What's interesting is when you when I look at the, all these accounts uh, from this perspective, I find 
that almost always there's confirmation evidence in the narrative itself or somewhere else in the canon that confirms this reading. In the case of the conquest narrative, it's interesting that two different points, we have God sharing a nonviolent way of going into the, the, the land. Uh, in, in Leviticus 18, it says that I will cause the land, since they've defiled the land, I'll let the land be defiled and it will vomit them out. Probably means the, the produce will, will, will dry up. And so they'll migrate out and then I'll migrate you in. But I'm going to do it slowly, the Lord says, because otherwise the land would be overrun with wild bush and animals and it'd be hard for you to cultivate. Uh, in, in Exodus uh, 22, I think it is, I may be off on that, but he says that, that uh, he says, I, I will go ahead, ahead of you and I will uh, send a hornet or, or some kind of nasty insect and drive them out. And, and, but again, he says, I'm not going to do it fast. I'm going to do it uh, slowly so that you'll be uh, reproduced more. And that so the land will become overrun with wild, wild brush. And there's nine other places where God just says, I'll drive them out without specifying how he'll drive them out. So the question is, what happened to those plans? Well, you go from there, hey, I'll use, those sound like a lot more Christ-like ways of relocating a population. Yeah, I'll gradually migrate them off. Uh, how come all of a sudden it's like, slaughter them all, kill them all, don't let any breathe? Yeah, I, I, I really believe that, that it's, not that, it's not that God changed his mind or anything like that. I, I, in this case, I, I think his, those instructions went in one ear and out the other. It's just like Jesus he tells his disciples for three years straight, hey, I got to go to Jerusalem get, and, and get arrested and, and, and crucified. Well, when it actually happens, they're shocked. And they're, yeah. they lose their faith. Why? Because that teaching went against everything that they believed the Messiah was going to do. You've heard of confirmation bias. It's a, it's a psychological reality. But we see what we want to see and we hear what we want to hear. And that itself is a biblical truth that it runs throughout the Bible. How, the way you see God will reflect the condition of your heart. And, and so... I, I think God said, hey, I give you the promised land. What Moses hears is, hey, I give you the promised land, so therefore go kill everybody, which is how any ancient Near Eastern person would, would, would hear it. And so it, it just imagine how much it must grieve the heart of God to have to accept that. But he stays in covenant with his people. He stoops to enter into their perspective, allows them to tell the story. And, and I mean, it, it must grieve the heart of God, which itself is a way that, it, that this episode points to the cross. Yeah, the, the portrait of God saying, slaughter them all, I think, that reflects what God's people at the time thought about God. What reflects the real God to us is that God let them think that and stayed in, in solidarity with them and continued to use them uh, to further his purposes in this world. Yeah, I can even see yeah. that in a couple of places in Joshua as well, when the angel of the Lord appears to Joshua and says, uh, Joshua asks, who are you for, yeah. for us or for them? And the angel says, neither. And then, I know it. Of course, then there's the other thing of when the Israelites go in and it's almost as if God says, OK, I gave you one way. You're going to do it another. So here are the ground rules. If you're going to do it, you're not getting any of the spoils of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, you're right. He enters into it and modifies it again as much as possible. And you see that going on throughout the whole biblical uh, uh, narrative. Uh, God inches them forward. That's why you have a progress of revelation in the Bible. You know, early on. You really would get the impression that God really enjoys the smell of burning carcasses because it says, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of times uh, that the Lord uh, smelled the sweet aroma of the sacrifices and it took delight in that, which is what every ancient Eastern person believed. Uh, they believed they were feeding the gods when they made sacrifices. And, and, and so the smell first attracts them and then they would come down and devour the sacrifice. Fortunately, in the Bible, we don't have any depictions of God eating the sacrifices, though we have two references to the sacrifices being Yahweh's food, which is interesting. So there's a little bit of a legacy there. So God was able to wean them off of that idea, uh, but apparently they weren't ready to let go of the idea that he, at least he likes it. He takes delight in it. So the smelling aroma uh, uh, stayed. Later on, though, we find out that God doesn't enjoy the smell of burning carcasses and he doesn't want sacrifices at all. What he wants is mercy and justice. And then later on, we find that not only does God not demand sacrifices, but he is himself the sacrifice. So it's a whole progress of revelation, which, which, which you expect if, if you're dealing with a God who's not going to coercively lobotomize people to think true thoughts. God has to patiently work with them, influence them, and lead them to the point where humanity would be ready for Christ to come in and uh, save the world. You know, we could talk about this all day long, but you're out of time and we're out of time. So we're going to wrap it up with this last question. What is it right. that's saving your soul right now? 
What is saving my soul? Yeah, what is it that's saving your soul right now? Wrong question. Who is saving my soul? And it's Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, that was too easy. You want me to be a little, a little more uh, brass tacks? Other than Jesus. Oh, yeah, you're fine. What is it? Well, that, you know, or how about this? How is Jesus saving your soul? Or how is God <laughs> okay. working in your life right now? I'm just being pedantic. No, uh, it, it's, well, what was saving me is I, I, uh, I, I've got a lot of wonderful people around me. Uh, community community saves me, sustains me. It's so, it's so important to be around people who share your uh, core convictions, you know, and, and model for one another, you know, Christ likeness and things like that. My wife is 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 certainly one of the ways, ways that Jesus saves me. Uh, I would be so lost without her. I don't have an organizational cell in my brain, and so she keeps my life on track. And the, 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 the times I have with, with Jesus, um, the inner sanctum stuff, that is, to me, the lifeline. I, I, that sustains me. I, I, I regularly take an hour or two and, and just go on a Jesus journey, me and Jesus. And, and sometimes, not always, sometimes it's just, yeah, so-so, but sometimes God shows up in so many beautiful ways. It, it, you know that you're dealing with the Holy Spirit when things come to you in your imagination that you know you would never say. And, and could never con- con- concoct. Like I gave earlier that that memory of my grandmother coming in. I never had remembered that before. It, it, the, the babysitter jarred that in me. And and then once it comes to the surface, then Jesus shows up. And I never, I never would have thought of that. It, it, it was just, and that's just one example. I could give you 4,000, but that, that's my lifeline. The people that I'm surrounded by who are always, you know, just encouraging and uplifting. And they can have faith when you're weak on it. Uh, but then also just the, the own pipeline with, with Jesus. I, I think that personal dimension there is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely so- social or, or uh, central. You, you know, in, in the church history, we often have this this dichotomy between Christians who are social activists and Christians who are pietists. And, and, and those are seen as kind of two alternative ways of being spiritual. But I really believe it's both. And that the social dimension of the gospel is predicated on our personal dimension of the gospel. Our, it's our lifeline with Jesus that gives us the life, the fuel, the motivation, the power, and the insight to go out and change the world in a Jesus kind of way. So I think they go hand in hand. Thank you, Greg. And thank you for being with us. Bill's going to put <laughs> links to uh, your books and all your work that you're doing in our show notes because he does all the real work around here. Your audience can know that you can uh, find me at renew.org with a K, R-E-K-N-E-W.org. Got a lot of resources there. And you can follow me on Twitter with Greg Boyd, and I'm out there. Hey, God bless you you guys. Keep up the great work. God bless you, Greg.